So in this talk, I mainly will share my personal experience uh, from this long working history and uh, share some of my um, knowledge uh, on the video codec optimization uh, architecture design for like a software for DSP and uh, now also for like a hardware. Um, I will leave about uh, 10 to 15 minutes um, for Q&A session. Um, so now let's go to the agenda. This is a brief agenda of my talk. First, I will give a brief personal introduction, uh, followed by a high level introduction to video conferencing technology. In the earlier days, we developed our video conferencing products on video oriented DSP. Then we move on to hardware based solution nowadays. In today's video conferencing, we could do many things such as uh, content sharing, smart whiteboarding, uh, smart camera. We also have a lot of machine learning capabilities. The advancement of hardware does make a huge impact to video conferencing technology. The video oriented uh, DSP and hardware chips have made uh, the video conferencing products to be able to support higher and higher resolution and uh, more channels. I will also give some details about some typical optimization methods on software on DSP and uh, also for hardware. Finally, I would share my personal view of the future trend of video conferencing technology. So, personally, I've been working with the video compression, video conferencing industry for more than 20 years in many companies, uh, startup companies like uh, uh, UB Video. WW Communication and uh, the public company like uh, Poly. My main responsibilities were on the video encoder work, on architecture design, on the video quality evaluation, on uh, codec optimization. I have worked on many platforms such as uh, PC platform, ARM platform, DSP, and the hardware chips. Uh, I have also worked on many standards like from 261 to 263, 264, and uh, 265. Uh, I have also like seen the video conferencing products to evolve from the standard definition to high definition now to Archer HD 4K. Uh, in this procedure, the like uh, advancement of hardware definitely played a very key role. So many many years ago, uh, our video conferencing products were like 261, 263 based, with very low resolution, for example, QCIF or CIF. Uh, after the appearance of the specialized uh, DSP for video processing, uh, such as TI DM642 DSP and equator chip um, with the newer standard like uh, 264, our video conferencing product made a big uh, jump to standard definition with much better quality. The, also, like a, after that, we have some special chip for video processing, such as a TI DaVinci chip. Um, that's um, like a chip designed for video processing. 
with TI Da Vinci, we were able to support like a 720p resolution. And uh, we now we have a lot more chips like Qualcomm Snapdragon chips, MediaTek MT series. We also have Broadcom decoder chips. We have NVIDIA chips. Now with those like a new chips, the video conferencing products move to high definition and ultra HD with also some new features. Those like a new uh, chip also have some AI capabilities. And the video conferencing like a market is always the first to adopt new coding standards from 263 to 264 to 265. Uh, another interesting codec to monitor is AV1. AV1 is a royalty free codec with similar performance as H265. And um, if they are like a, a lot of chip companies can support AV1, then we might consider switch to AV1. So in terms of the performance of video standards, um, 264 is a lot better than MPEG-2 in terms of coding efficiency. It gives about 75% bit reduction at the same visual quality, um, but it also a lot more complex compared to 260 uh, MPEG-2 encoder. 264 encoder is more than 10 times more complex. Uh, 265 also gives about gives about 50% bit reduction compared to 264, but uh, 265 encoder is another 10 times complex increase than 264 encoder. So for the last few decades, we get uh, new coding standards every seven to 10 years. The new coding standard typically gives about 50% bit reduction, but uh, you already introduced about 10 times complex increase. Um, we are going to 266 is already like a, a standardized. Uh, it's also about 10 times more complex than 265. So where does the complexity come from? This is a like a general encoder flow for this is for 265, but all the codecs should be similar. Um, for the input like a video, we are going to configure the input frame either as intro frame or inter frame. For intro frame, we do intro prediction. That means all the prediction happens inside of the current picture. We don't have temporal prediction. For inter frame, we do motion estimation to exploit uh, temporal dependency. Then we have the residual data sent to transform and quantization module. And the coefficients micro block header, they are coded by, we have two Usually, two kinds of entropy coding method. Either is Huffman coding, CABRC, or Kapak, that's uh, arithmetic coding. Uh, we also go through the inverse transform to get the reconstructed frame. The reconstructed frame will be sent to deblocking filter and the sample adaptive offset filter to reduce blocking artifacts and improve the prediction for the next frame. So for the complexity um, in the earlier standards, for example, 261, 263, and PAC-2, motion estimation is the most time consuming module uh, in our new standard from 264 to 265, 266. Now the like a mode decision become more and more time consuming uh, because we just have a lot more petition to choose from. 
uh, for each partition, we need to go through so-called partition, just like a coding block. We need to go through the motion estimation, motion compensation, reconstruction, like a lot of steps. We need to calculate uh, rate distortion cost. Um, Callback in this, those like a uh, new standard is very difficult to optimize because it's a uh, sequential in nature. We, it's very difficult to run Callback like a uh, coding in parallel. Uh, the context modeling probability update linearization of Callback take uh, most of the cycles. Those things are very difficult for parallel processing. In 265, there's a feature called the wavefront parallel coding, parallel processing. Uh, that's for callback. It allows like a parallel processing at the cost of some quality loss. Um, but compared to the other partition method, like uh, we can divide the whole frame into tire, into slices, WPP can give smaller coding loss. So this is an example of 264 partition. For 264, we have two level of partition. The first level of partition is going to decide microblock type. We have four different possible macro block type, either 16 by 16 or 16 by 8, 8 by 16 or 8 by 8. Once we decide the, the best macro block type, if we choose 8 by 8 as the best, we are going to define, decide the sub macro block type. We have four uh, sub macro block type, which is 8 by 8, 8 by 4, 4 by 8, or 4 by 4. So for each block, we need to go through many coding steps. We need to go to like uh, intro prediction, motion estimation, uh, motion composition, reconstruction, cost calculation. That's a lot of uh, complexity. Now this picture shows the four by four intro prediction for 264. We have nine modes. Um, one mode is DC mode, is always available. The other eight modes are directional prediction. The, like a directional angle between two prediction modes is about 22.5 degree. Um, intro prediction, four by four intro prediction introduces a lot of complexity because the prediction is based on the reconstruction pixels. That means for each four by four block, we need to go through the whole coding procedure before we can do the intro prediction for the next four by four block. Um, the 264 intro prediction is slightly better than JPEG 2000. Um, for 265, the intro prediction is a lot more complex. It has 35 modes, 33 directional compared to eight in 264. So the degree between two neighboring intro prediction modes in 265 is about 5.6 degree. So it can give us much more accurate prediction than 264. Uh, and uh, in 265, there's uh, another special profile called screen content coding profile uh, that gives another coding tool called the intro block copy. The intro block copy actually does the motion estimation inside of the current frame. For the current block, we code, we can do motion search on the blocks that's already coded and then we code the motion vector in this current picture. That's so-called intro block copy. It gives a very good coding efficiency for screen content, for just like, uh, for example, the document sharing, these kind of things. So 
here, these slides show some key encoder operations. For motion estimation, we basically apply block matching algorithm. The block in current frame is searched in reference frames for the best match. The search cost has two paths. One is the SAD, uh, it's meaning sum of absolute difference and the cost of coding motion vector. That's RM, means like a rate of motion vector. To compute RM, first we need to get the motion vector predictor. The motion vector predictor in our like a new standard, we have spatial uh, predictors, also temporal predictors. From those predictors, we are going to choose the best one as our predictor. Then we compute the differential vector, which means, okay, we subtract the real motion vector from the predictor. That's our differential motion vector. Um, then we, we need to check how many bits we need to spend to compute the motion vector and add this cost to all our block matching cost. And uh, in the case of full search, we need to apply above operation to compute the set and the RM, like uh, for each search point. If our search window size is 64 by 64, then we need to compute the set and RM for 4096 um, motion vector positions. That's a lot of calculation. And um, after motion search, we, we find the best motion vector and SAD for each block. Then we need to uh, go to another procedure called the read constraint mode decision. In equation three, the D is our distortion of the reconstructed block versus arranging the block. R is the like a rate we need for coding block headers. So in, in public code, we need to go through all those steps, but in real application, we need to do a lot of optimization, mainly on the motion estimation and the multi station, um, these two modules. There are other operations such as uh, DCT transform, discrete cosine transform, quantization, deep blocking, entropy coding. From optimization or algorithm point of view, those operations are kind of fixed operation. We need to write, optimize the code for, for those operations, but mainly just like uh, using CMD instruction set um, to make things faster, not too much from algorithm point of view. So in a typical like a video encoder, we have those steps. First, we need to do picture type decision the picture type module decides if the current picture shall be coded as intra or inter. And uh, then for intra picture, we just do intra prediction. For inter picture, we need to do both intra prediction and motion estimation. Then we choose the one that gives better read distortion cost. Uh, we then reconstruct the current block and apply the blocking operation to reduce blocking artifacts. We also need to code the current frame, like uh, residual data into BitStream. So this slide shows a few common motion search algorithms on software implementation. The top figure is a diamond search. Diamond search got this name because the search pattern is like a diamond. In each round of search, we search center point and uh, eight uh, surrounding points. For example, this one is the first round of search. 
out of those nine points, uh, this blue, like highlighted one, is the best uh, point out of those nine points. Then we move to the next round of search using this one blue one as the center. Um, the, the search will stop when the best search point, best point is the current center or after few number of iterations. The next figure is three-step search. It's similar. Basically, we start with a large search window step size, and then we gradually decrease the search window step size. Those search algorithms have the assumption that the search will move toward global minimal with each iteration. However, this assumption might not be true, and uh, we could get trapped in local minimum. Uh, the search algorithm could also add early exit thresholding scheme. If the motion search SAD is smaller than certain threshold, we could stop the search. The thresholding algorithm usually works well for low motion scenario. However, for medium to high motion case, uh, it doesn't work very well. The motion search on DSP is usually designed in a different way than software-based uh, algorithm. Uh, there are a few reasons. For PC, we have a lot of memory. We, when we design motion estimation algorithm, we don't really need to think about memory constraints. On DSP, we have limited on-chip memory. It, it's very slow to access external memory on DSP, so we need to load search window to on-chip memory first. Also, there's DMA on DSP that could load external memory to on-chip memory without CPU. So to get the best performance, we need to overlap DMA data loading and uh, CPU data processing so that uh, both run at the same time. Uh, because of above reasons, usually we use a sliding window algorithm for DSP motion search. With some special techniques such as uh, date preloading and date sharing, we could almost completely overlap the DMA date loading time and uh, CPU processing time. Uh, for motion estimation on DSP, the search window is usually non-square. We typically have a larger horizontal search range and a smaller vertical search range. This kind of motion pattern is true for our video conferencing application. Here we show one example of sliding window based motion estimation on DSP. Uh, for block two, we need the search window in red. For block three, we need the search window in green. We could see that there's a lot of overlapped region in those two windows. So on DSP chip, we load uh, like a few rows of macro blocks into on-chip memory using sliding window to reduce the memory bandwidth. So we don't want to load those re like uh, overlapped uh, micro blocks. Um, we just load it ahead of time once. For hardware, usually the motion search algorithm is different from software-based and the DSP based uh, algorithms. Because uh, on hardware, we have some special requirement usually. We want to cover much bigger motion range. Uh, 
for example, more than 256 pixels, we want to have better video quality. Uh, usually, we use multi-level approaches on hardware motion estimation, such as a hierarchical or pyramid motion estimation. Hardware is very good at that calculation, and uh, the hardware motion estimation, we typically we use fixed operation. We don't want to apply like adaptive stretch holding in the hardware motion search algorithm. This figure shows one typical motion estimation algorithm for hardware. Uh, the input image is done sampled into multi-level. The motion vector from lower resolution motion estimation is fed into higher resolution motion estimation for refinement. We can cover large search window in low resolution motion estimation. In order to avoid local minimum, we could send uh, a few candidate motion vectors to higher resolution motion estimation module. That's uh, a typical design for hardware motion estimation. So the previous slides show the typical motion estimation design for full pair motion search. After full pair motion search, we also need to do sub pair motion search using the best uh, full pair motion vector. The first step is to apply the interpolation filter to get half pair and quarter pair reference data. We use different filters for half pair and quarter pair positions. Uh, for example, in 264, we apply 1D separable six type filter for half pair position, horizontal, vertical, and diagonal. For horizontal or vertical half pair position, we need to process six pixels to get one interpolation result. For, for diagonal half pair positions, we need to do horizontal interpolation, then followed by the vertical interpolation or vice versa. Basically, we need to process 36 pixels to get one interpolation result. So interpolation is a um, quite time consuming procedure, but it does improve the coding um, efficiency a lot, gives a lot of quality improvement compared to full pair only motion search. Besides motion estimation, intro prediction, and mode decision, we have some other components like uh, DCT, motion compensation, deblocking filter, and uh, entropy coding. Entropy coding could become a bottleneck, especially cutback at high bitrate. The complexity of cutback, coding, decoding increase exponentially with a bitrate increase. At high bitrate, cutback could uh, consume more than 60-70% of CPU on software decoder. This is why we do need hardware accelerator to support uh, cutback encoding or decoding at high bitrate. Uh, for the software decoder, usually uh, the best we can support is 6 megabits per second. So the previous slides mainly focus on the video coding technology. Uh, now I will share my experience with Poly on video conferencing product development. Uh, since I joined Poly, I worked on like uh, many products. HDX is uh, our is the world first high profile based uh, 264 video conferencing product that could offer 
1080p 30 uh, conference call. It deals two TI DM6467 chips. Group series is the new product to replace uh, HDX. It uses a single TI DM8168, that's natural chip for 1080p 30 performance. For the last few years, we have been using a Qualcomm Snapdragon A35 and A65 for our new product development. We could uh, support 4K to 65 AI uh, in our new product now. So from 2000, uh, 264 based products appear in market with standard definition. In 2008, we shipped the world's first high profile based video conferencing product. Uh, 265 is a great coding standard. However, currently it's not heavily utilized in industry due to its high license fee. For video conferencing, low latency is very important. Why do we need the low latency? Because without low latency, user will notice audio video off sync issue easily. In live call, we could uh, hear echo, we could talk over each other. Uh, we have developed many special algorithms to achieve low latency. For example, we need a constant bit rate control. We need a network back pressure monitoring. The so-called back pressure is like a in calm layer. Uh, we have a rate control to send out uh, the encoded packets in constant uh, channel bandwidth. We, we need to check, okay, how many data are kept in this calm layer. We keep monitoring this like a back pressure value to adjust our rate control. We also have a gradual decoder refresh to uh, avoid the bit rate spike from intra frame. Our goal is to make the latency below 150 milliseconds for good user experience. So in my earlier career, I mainly focused on the developing DSP-based video conferencing products. Uh, we have used the TI-DM642 and the equator chip. Uh, TI-DM642 was a lot easier to use than equator chip. We came up with some special algorithms for DSP, such as the sliding window-based motion estimation into a prediction using arranging the pixels and the adaptive thresholding algorithms. At UB video, we shipped world's first real-time standard definition 264 baseline encoder on DM642. So in 2007, I joined Poly and switched to hardware-oriented uh, codec development. The first product is HDX. We built the product on TI-DM6467 chip. Uh, this is a chip with hardware accelerator for video encoding. The first work I did was to add a 241 support to the codec from TI. The, the meaning of 241 is to put one slice into one network packet with MTU size limitation. So in order to do that, we have to do re-encoding if the current slice size is over the MTU size limit, we have to re-encode the current slice and start a new slice. So the TI codec, we do have full source code. So what I did, I need to 
redesign the codec. It's a nice stage pipeline codec. We have to uh, stop the pipeline and restart the pipeline for the new slice. That's a very interesting work and uh, it's very hard work. I need to go through the 600 page TI document to figure out how to configure the hardware like a register properly. So TI DM6 Box 7 encoder use hardware accelerator for speed improvement. All the time consuming components are in hardware like a motion estimation, intro prediction, transform, quantization, deblocking, entropy coding. The codec has three main components. It's DSP plus ARM plus hardware accelerator architecture. DSP has a control code like rate control, picture type decision, mode decision. ARM core controls a hardware accelerator. Um, we could configure motion estimation search pattern into a prediction pattern for this codec. Using TIDM6467, we developed a 1080p30 product. Using Qualcomm Snapdragon 835, we developed 4K30 products with AI capability. We can do face detection, people counting, room analysis. Using Qualcomm Snapdragon 865, we developed 4K60 with a more advanced AI feature like smart camera. Now we can talk a little bit about 265. Our product supports 265. 265 gives about 50% uh, bit reduction compared to 264. Um, but it's also a lot more complex than 264. It, in 265, there are some better parallel processing tools. One is wavefront parallel processing. This is for cutback to like a uh, code cutback in parallel. Uh, it's better than tire and the slice in terms of the coding efficiency, but uh, wavefront coding is more difficult to implement than slice or tire. In 265, the deep blocking filter size also changed from 4x4 to 8x8 to allow parallel processing of the deep blocking edges. In, in 264, you cannot do like a parallel processing because the block size dependency. Um, the 265 cutback also is simplified compared to 264. But uh, again, like a 265 is not widely used just because, mainly because of the high license fee. For the optimization method, we, here we are mainly talk about the software-based code or DSP-based code. For software-based code, we need to design the fast motion estimation algorithms, uh, such as diamond search, three-step search with early exit thresholding scheme. We need to use like um, CMD instructions for SAD calculation. Uh, for example, if we use some something like MM two fifty six. Um, bit instruction to calculate a set for 32 bytes and 
in using just one instruction, we could get uh, 63 times speed up compared to single byte calculation. If we use AVX 512 instruction, we could uh, get even more performance improvement. So on ARM, we need to use a uh, NEON instruction set like uh, ARM v7, ARM v8 to improve the performance. For DSP based code, we need to design the motion estimation algorithm using sliding window approach. We need to overlap DMA loading time and date processing time accurately. We need to use profiler to figure out exact time we spend on like a DMA loading and data processing, try to overlap them properly. So usually when we do optimization, we need to go step by step. First step is always try to make sure we have reasonable, very good architecture. Um, once we have the good architecture, we need to figure out with um, what, what are the bottlenecks. So for the bottlenecks, we are going to write CMD or intrinsic function to optimize those bottleneck functions. For hardware, basically optimization is already done by the vendor, chip vendor. We just need to understand how to configure it properly, how to evaluate the performance properly. So for parallel processing, 264, uh, slice coding is the main parallel processing approach. The main issues for slice-based coding is first quality loss. The slice coding basically means we don't have dependency between two slices. So we can encode multiple slices in multiple CPU cores. But uh, this is going to introduce some quality loss. And also there's another load balancing issue. The complexity of those slices might be quite different. So we might have some slices finish much earlier than the other slices. For 265, we have a few more like a parallel processing approach. Tire is similar to slice, but with lower overhead, so smaller coding loss. Wavefront parallel processing is better than slice and tire, but more difficult to implement. And uh, for decoder, um, if we want to parallelize decoder, we could de dedicate one CPU for entropy decoding and uh, put other components into another CPU. And for parallel encoder, we could uh, just divide the whole image into multiple slice tire or use WPP to fully utilize CPU. So in our product, we also have some machine learning capability. This is a general like a flow about in our system. We send our video camera, like a camera frames to local preview for end user. We also send camera frames to machine learning module. From machine learning module, we could analyze the frame to detect people, faces, objects, whiteboard to improve user experience. Then we can adjust camera to let the camera have better like a front view of the, the speaker um, to improve the overall video conferencing experience. Our Machine learning algorithms run on hardware accelerator from Qualcomm. It's called the uh, hexagon delegation.
for the last few years, we started to add machine learning to our products. With machine learning, we could bet, provide much better user experience. Uh, for example, we could find and focus on the active speaker. We could find the uh, uh, valid region with like a people. That's that's called the group framing. We don't want to uh, when we, when when people are in two or three people are in a big conference room. We don't really want to show the the big conference room from very far. We want to the camera to focus on those like a. Uh, two or three people we want to zoom into a small portion of the whole conference room. Qualcomm chip has special hardware for machine learning. It's called Hexagon Delegation, or HDA. We also, we are doing some research on applying machine learning on video coding. So, for the future trend of video conferencing, uh, we are going to continue to make our products better. For example, we want to have in-person experience with higher and higher resolution from 1080p to 4K, maybe even higher. We want to have better content sharing experience make it easier for sharing and working together online. We want to have a smart camera capability um, to just uh, basically improve our user experience. We want to have some advanced conference room usage analysis. Okay, in summary, video conferencing technology is moving to hardware now. With hardware, we can support, um, like uh, do a lot, lot more things. We can support high resolution. We can uh, like add the AI capability. We can just make our video conferencing product more and more user-friendly. Um, that's pretty much all I have today. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm open to questions now. Hey, um, David, thank you very much. Uh, this is really good. It just uh, gives us a lot of information about the state of the uh, video industry uh, now. And uh, it's reminded me so many things about uh, video because uh, um, I was the one, that, um, I was the manager for the video conference in the TI. Uh, that, that was when we released the uh, Natra and the uh, DaVinci HD. So my uh, team built the reference design hardware and port the Kodak uh, for Cisco, Holocom yeah. uh, to use. So this is really good. It's uh, bringing back like all the stuff that um, I had done. Uh, anyway, so um, any questions from uh, the uh, attendees? Uh, you can you can raise your hand or you can do in the chat, and I will refer it. Uh, I will read it uh, to David. Anybody? So I guess uh, while we waiting for questions to come in, uh, David, I I really want to. Uh, make sure people understand the key differences between um, video conferencing coding and Hollywood and people like, you know, coding a uh, movie. Yes. Um, uh, you know, like for you, you rely on slice-based coding. And so uh, could you talk about the slice-based coding and frame-based coding and the differences and why it's slice-based coding is... Uh, more important for video conferencing? I know you talk about it, but people that are not doing video would not understand yeah. so, what, so uh, what you mean. Yeah, yeah, like for, for, for video codec, usually we have different markets. Video conferencing is a big market. and The streaming is another big market. The codec design for these two markets 
are quite different because like for video conferencing market, the, the biggest requirement is low latency. There's no such requirement for streaming application. Uh, so that's why in streaming application, uh, they, they don't have real time requirement for video conferencing because it's two way communication. You have to send the data in real time. If you don't send the like a video coded data in real time, we are going to get into audio video off sync problem. Uh, that's why in like a uh, video conferencing product development, anything introducing like a latency should be avoided. For example, intro frame coding, you already will have to reduce the intro frame size by assigning a large QP for intro frame. Also for B frame coding, like a by prediction, because B frame we want to pre we need to predict from future frame. We need to do the reordering of the B string. That's going to introduce latency. We cannot do B frame coding. But all those like uh, going those features are in streaming application. The purpose for streaming application just try to get the best coding efficiency for Hollywood to like. Uh, their movie production, they they don't need to consider like a latency. They can spend right. the two, three minutes to encode one frame. So that's the difference from our application. Yeah, um, I wanna follow up with that too, uh, David. Um, so what happened is in, in video conference and uh, so for Hollywood, for movie, you do the whole frame, uh, you code the whole frame. Uh, for video conferencing, you split it out into multiple slides. And then you make the slides independent, transmit so you can lower the latency. But then you run into um, artifacts between slides. Yeah. You know, you're going to get some noise. And, and what are there tricks in a, like that that you can play to make sure that the inter slides uh, have minimum uh, artifacts? Yeah, basically, like uh, the slice is going to introduce some problem, like a, a boundary problem. But we also right. apply deep blocking filter at the end of coding. The deep blocking filter, we have different options, right? We can filter uh, within a slice. We can filter across a slice. So you already will choose to filter across a slice oh, to reduce the, the deep block. Yeah, across oh, okay. the slice boundary to reduce the. Uh, the blocking artifacts at the slice boundary. Okay. What are, what about the motion vectors? You know, because now can you point the motion vectors across the slice as well? Yeah. Motion vectors is no constraint. You can point to anywhere in previous reference frame. Okay. So you can pull it from different slides. Of course. Okay. Got it. Got yeah. It. Otherwise, it's going to introduce too big of quality loss. If yeah. we have to constrain the motion vector within a slice. Yeah, yeah. Let me see if anybody, uh, okay. Okay, and uh, so I, I don't see any question. I, um, I don't mind the continue, but uh, uh, we, we have uh, about 12 people online. So, uh, you know, if, if any of um, you guys have questions, please do. Uh, if you don't, I continue to talk with David, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. That's uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Give it opportunity. Uh, anybody? Uh, anybody out there have a question for David? Anything at all? Anybody working on video? So okay. So um, the the other thing about. Um, uh, video conference, and we touched a little bit before the seminar, David, is the uh, transcoding. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and I tell you, all of you guys, if, you, if you're listening, the thing that I did a lot of work on video conference and, uh, at TI, and, and I saw what Zoom video did, you know, coming out of nowhere, started a company in like early 2000, and took the market by storm. I mean, yeah. we got hit by pandemic and you know, Zoom video became a standard for the whole world to, uh, to use. 
And this is an amazing story. I, I cannot talk uh, enough about it. No, knowing you know a little about video that I know, mm -hmm. um, you know, they're doing what they they do. It's uh, amazing. Now, uh, back when we did video conference in, uh, in the uh, uh, 2010, 2011, 2009 kind of timeframe, the biggest problem is the interoperable. You know, uh, Polycom cannot call Tembo, Tembo cannot call Cisco, Cisco cannot call Polycom. And so somehow Zoom video just came out and, and really uh, created a standard do you know what's uh, what's happening there, David? How how does that kind of? I I think it's good for students to know that yeah. you know no matter what you can always come up with a new idea to take over the market. That's that's how I look at it, and that's something right. that people have been working for on it for years. I don't know how many years that TI worked on and all the world, and suddenly this startup took over the market. What, think, uh, what, what's yeah. your point? What's your opinion? I, I probably can give some my personal opinion, right? Doesn't have to be correct. Oh, no, um, no, yeah. yeah. That's my personal opinion too, yeah, exactly. I think one thing like uh, Zoom does wear is instead of transcoding, their service is based on media relay. So media relay, you don't do transcoding. That's going to improve the coding efficiency a lot. Transcoding introduces large quality drop because we have to do decoding and re-encoding. But from my understanding, Zoom service is based on relay. That means they just like uh, send the base stream, right? They take the base stream, send from transmitter, and they forward the base stream to receiver without transcoding. Are, but, but then how can they support multiple standards? Do they only use one standard? Because see, you can you can call in H.263, you know, H.264, H.265, or MPEG-1, right? I don't think they support all kinds of lexical. That's one headache for the, the companies like Polycom, like Hamburg. They need to support all kinds of lexical standards. But oh. I don't think Zoom does that. They they probably just uh, support a few 264, 265. That's all they want to they support. So what they do, just like uh, they do relay, media relay instead of transcoding. That's going to give us two huge benefits. One is the quality improvement. One is yeah. latency. Right, right. That's my understanding how it works. But we, we, we like uh, don't have that kind of like a capability right now, we when we design a new code, we always need to think about all kinds of latency, uh, legacy codec. We we are even supporting two sixty one now. So that that's a <laughs> but major you can, difference. You cannot get rid of legacy. Can you just say, hey, all the calls are H.264? That's kind of marketing people decision and right? not really a technical decision. So huh. uh, that, that the big company, when they make such decision, usually it's not technical decision. Interesting. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, the legacy. It's really a, um, a tough way of making the Kodak better, you know, because uh, kind of like Windows, uh, you know, people say why it's embedded OS is so much better. You know, you look at like QNX and, and all these uh, Linux and better Linux, but Windows, they have to carry that package. And so it has to be compatible. That's why it's really hard to do. Interesting. Okay. So um, I don't have any other um, questions and I don't see anything coming from the audience. Uh, David, uh, Joe, you have any um, last word? Of I, I just had a little question on, uh, you mentioned VR on like one of the last slides, I think. I was kind of wondering what uh, Polly's thinking there. Is there any 
uh, are you involved in that right now? Is it kind of a future thing? Yeah. AI, you're talking about the AI? Or? Uh, Because you mentioned VR somewhere in there, like in one of the last slides. Uh, yeah, let's AR, see, probably, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, let's. Uh, yeah. Oh, VR. Yeah. There it is. VR, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. In person experience. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we, we are like uh, working a lot on AI now. Uh, we mm -hmm. are trying to do a lot of like AI. Um, basically, let me show. This is the architecture we have right now, right? Mm -hmm. um, we have the camera frame can go to machine learning module. We have two separate video paths. One path mm -hmm. sent to machine learning, one path sent to local preview video codec. Mm -hmm. So we are good. We are actually doing a lot of analysis for the camera video and then mm. adjust our camera accordingly. That's mm. going to improve our video codec. Uh, like uh, basically video codec uh, just take whatever video frame, right? But those video frame might not have good quality. Mm. With help of machine learning module, we can improve the incoming frames. Mm. to make the incoming frames better, like uh, from better camera focus, from sure. better camera framing. Mm -hmm. the, the, just in turn, we are going to get a better user experience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very cool. <laughs> very cool. Well, yeah. one, one more I have that just come up, uh, David, while you're talking about VR, Joe. Uh, mm -hmm. What happened is uh, years ago, they had a new coding standard called multi-view. And yeah. that was for 3D coding. Yeah. Um, you know how, because right now all the video coding is 2D and you have one more dimension. So they call that yeah. uh, multi-view coding. Yeah. Does that play into the VR at all? I haven't heard about it lately. How does it work? Yeah, it's supposed to... It's a similar idea, right? Like uh, multi view can generate a VR kind of um, user experience, but uh, we have not experienced that yet because of display technology. Um, oh. Our, our we, we just don't, usually you need to wear special goggles in order to really get a 3D experience. But sure. our world thinking is with 3D goggle is not going to be a, like a user-friendly thing to do. You, yeah. Usually people don't really want to wear something special to have that kind of experience, right? Mm -hmm. So our, once the 3D display technology is mature, we probably need to think about go to 3D kind of video conferencing. Well, see, can I, can I uh, this is just an idea I'm thinking out loud. Uh, can I do a multi-view on a virtual reality so that I can fix the problem you're talking about display? Because now I have virtual reality. If I do multi-view, then I can have a 3D video conferencing with you, seeing you in the room, right? Not really. I'm talking about display technology, right? Right, right. But that's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about a half-mounted display. But we we try to avoid that, right? Like uh, if we wear a goggle, we can get a 3D experience, but that kind of 3D goggle usually makes people sick after a while. Right, no, no, I, I understand, David. I'm thinking technically speaking, mm -hmm. because now we already have VR, mm -hmm. right? Can I do a VR video conference and with a goggle using multi-view to be able okay. to uh, to do that. Technically speaking, I'm Technically, not Technically, we probably can do that. Okay. So, so there you are. That's the capstone, uh, master student capstone. There you go. <laughs> we'll, make a, we'll make a call for a project. <laughs> <laughs> so, David, we, we yeah, have a, yeah. we, uh, our master students have to do a capstone project. And both Joe and I are, are working on, on that. That we we mm -hmm. try to do some cool things. That um, yeah, this could be something that we'll, we'll look at doing a uh, yeah yeah a multi-view video uh, 3D um, over HDM, HMD. Okay, okay, 
That's and then crazy. and then we'll be calling you in 3D uh, exactly. in the next seminar. <laughs> wow, nice, nice. <laughs> that sounds cool, guys. Yeah. Anything else? I think we went uh, ten minutes after, um, but I don't see any other any other questions. So, uh, any last minute from you, David? Thank you very much uh, for for the uh, insight. Uh, I really enjoy it. Uh, any last word from you about Polly and uh, how you want students to come work with Polly? <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, you're always welcome. Like uh, Polly mm -hmm. is a company probably has a good future, right? Especially because of pandemic. So yeah. <laughs> more, more and more people are working remotely with video conferencing. Uh, style. So you're always welcome to join. We always need good people. That's good. Thank you, uh, Joe. Any any last word? I uh, know. Yeah, just thank you, David. Really enjoyed the talk and getting to chat with you. Thank you very much. Okay, so that's it all. Thank you, and uh, you know, I'm sure we'll talk again, David. Maybe we'll we'll. Uh, We'll do the uh, the video thing with you one day. <laughs> okay, thank you very okay, much. Okay, all right, bye-bye. Bye. bye. bye.